Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grace Church at Franklin here in Franklin, Tennessee. We are located at 4052 Arno, A-R-N-O Road, just minutes south of Nashville, Tennessee. Want to extend an invitation to all of you who may be tuning in by the internet that if you're in the Nashville, Tennessee area, we'd love to have you come out and worship with us. We have classes on Sunday mornings at 10, classes on Tuesday evening at 645, and worship here at 1045 every Sunday morning. You can view our services on YouTube, Ustream, and Sermon Audio Video. We'd like to begin our services with a reading from God's Word and a word of prayer to petition the Lord. And to do that this morning, our Brother Dave Roberts is going to come. All right. Good morning. I have chosen um, Psalm 96 for our reading of the word, I'm reading from the New King James Version. It's a song of praise to God coming in judgment. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the people, O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar and all its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. The word of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father, we come today to thank you for another time to come into your presence and worship you. We come to thank you for your mercy and grace to us who believe. We thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We come humbly and boldly to your throne room to make our petitions. Please pour your spirit out on pastor and give him the words we need to hear today. Open our hearts and minds and prepare them to hear them. Father, there are those amongst us who are ill and some grieve over lost ones. Please attend to them. Place your hand of comfort on them. We lift up our country. We have lost our moral compass. We need to repent. We, the church, need to be the salt and light to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. We pray you will bring about a Nineveh experience to our country. We ask these things in the name of our great Savior and Lord uh, God, Jesus. Amen. to stand up with us please we're gonna sing the uncloudy day to kick it off this morning y'all sing with me 
Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a place where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of that uncloudy day. cloudy sky oh they tell me of a place where no storm clouds rise oh they tell me of an uncloudy day oh they tell me of a place where my friends have gone oh they tell me of a land far away where the tree of life in eternal bloom shares its fragrance on an uncloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Oh, the land of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of a land where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles Drives their sorrows away. Oh, they tell me of a sorry, can't see. <laughs> in that lovely land of uncloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Oh, the land of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of a place where no storm. that chorus again. Oh, the land of cloudless days. Oh, the land of an uncloudy sky. Oh, they tell me of a place where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Amen. What Brother Dave read, uh, what, what did it say, Brother Dave? The, the trees shall praise the Lord. The tree reminds me of that song, Jehovah Jireh. We need to do that. Yeah, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Y'all sing, you know, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. There's a part to that song that says, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands, clap their hands, clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands while we go out with joy. We need to sing that soon, do that whole thing. Isn't that right? If men won't praise the Lord, then His creation will, right? All right. Miss Sue said, let's do this other fast one. So we're going to do What a Mighty God We Serve. <laughs> Ready? What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. Let me hear you. What a mighty God we serve. There you go. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. His name is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, <laughs> what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and what a mighty God we serve. I will call upon the Lord, for He is worthy to be praised. I will call upon His name, for He is worthy to be praised. Now 
shout Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. What a mighty God we serve. Y'all can clap your hands if you want. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He hath made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. What a mighty God we serve, what a mighty God we serve, angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him, what a mighty God we serve, oh what a mighty God we serve, amen, amen to that. Okay, I believe that's the end of my time. Brother Bill. Good to see all of you here today. And I hope you've had a good week. We, we're glad to see you. And of course, I want to say again that uh, uh, we're on YouTube, Ustream, and Sermon Audio Video. If you have friends or family who live in other areas in the world, actually, tell them about uh, our simulcast or whatever they call it on the internet, and they can watch it. From time to time, we introduce some new songs to you. So up there in the booth, we're supposed to have this song called the Spirit Song, and hope somebody's up there that can put it up on the board there it is how many of you have heard this song some of you may have you may have heard it but you don't know, recognize the title to it so i'm going to try to teach it to you we haven't had time to really rehearse it properly but uh leave that verse up there uh twice and uh then that maybe maybe you can sing it with me the second time it goes like this Oh, let the Son of God enfold you with the Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and treasures by your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you and His Spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole. Sing it with me now. Oh, let the Son of God unfold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have the things that hold you with His Spirit like a dove will descend upon your life make you whole. Here's where the chorus goes. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your land. Jesus, oh Jesus, come Sing the song with gladness as your hearts are filled with love. Lift your hands in sweet surrender to his name. Oh, give him all. 
more your tears and sadness Give him all your cares and pain And you'll enter into life in Jesus' name Sing the chorus with me of God enfold you with his spirit and his love let him fill your heart and satisfy your soul oh let him have the things that hold you and his spirit like a dove will descend upon your life and make you whole sing the chorus with me now Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your land. Jesus, oh Jesus, come and fill your land. Sing the chorus one more time. Just heard it. Come on. I think that's a good song, and I think it uh, has a lot of truth in it. And so I would like for us to learn it. Would you stand together with me, and uh, you can turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. And I'm going to be talking to you today. This is still a last day's study. But I'm going to talk to you today about who is our Messiah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that the battle in the, the so-called last days will be around the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. People will misrepresent him. They will uh, say that he's something that he's not or that he's not something that the Scripture says he is. And so I'm going to cover some ground that most people who worship here are familiar with. But you know, the old saying is, repetition is the art of learning. The way you learned your ABCs was by going over and over and over and over them. And now when you, somebody says, say your ABCs, you can say it without even thinking about it. And that's the way we should be with God's Word. We should, if that's a good term, overlearn it so that we know whom we have believed. We don't claim to have all the doctrines perfectly right. You're going to go to heaven believing some things that aren't true or not believing some things that are, but you better know whom you have believed. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 it shall come to pass in the last days, 
saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word, and let God's people say, praise the Lord. You may be seated, and we'll sing our little song today. Sometimes we don't do it, but you can hold your hands up while you're in the pew if you want to. Father, I stretch my hand to Thee, no other help I know. If I withdraw myself from Thee, there shall I go Ah, there shall I go All right, we've learned in our last study that in the last days there will be several different signs the last days we just read from Acts chapter 2, the last days will be marked with times of refreshing from the Lord. The Spirit of God will be poured out, and he says here that the Spirit of God will be poured out on all flesh, that is, Gentiles as well as Jews. God will not be dealing exclusively with Israel. And not exclusively with just men, he says, Gentiles and Jews, men and women. And I explained to you last week what some of this other language in these passages, uh, verse 17 down to verse 21, means. So you can get last week's study on a CD. All you have to do is fill in a slip out there. There's no charge for it. And pick that up and listen to that last study. So from Acts chapter 2, we learned that the last days, you notice verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit. And that spirit will empower, and that spirit will teach and guide and enlighten the believers to be able to proclaim the gospel, the good news, throughout the world. And this period, which is the period we're living in now, will be marked, if you look at verse 21, Acts chapter 2, verse 21, be marked by this, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the first mark, and I'm just reviewing for you what we studied last week of the last days, there will be times of refreshing from the Lord in the last days. Number two, we looked at James chapter 5. You don't have to turn there, but it's James chapter 5, verses 1, 2, and 3. The last days will be marked by times of increasing prosperity. The problem will be that prosperity will lead to greediness, and greediness will lead to ungodliness, and ungodliness will lead to persecution and oppression. And persecution and oppression will bring judgment from heaven. That's James chapter 5, verse 3 says, And now you rich people, listen to me, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted away. Your clothes have been eaten by moths. Your gold and your silver are covered with rust. And this rust will be a witness against you. And will eat up your flesh like fire. You've piled up riches for the last days. The third mark of the last days, according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
will be increasingly dangerous and difficult times. Let me read it for you. This know that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, uncontrollable, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, filled with themselves, high-minded, filled with pride, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny the power of it, turn away from them. Now, again, last week I opened up every one of these words and told you what they all mean in modern English, and that's study number nine on the last days. You can get that. No charge for that. The last days will be marked also by increasing ungodliness, according to this passage, 2 Timothy 3, persecution, increasing persecution of believers, ridicule, of the Bible, and especially hateful and mocking the second coming of the Messiah. Listen to this, Second Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, knowing this, that there shall come in the last days. You notice that every one of these passages, the Acts 2 passage, the James 5 passage, the Second Timothy 3 passage, and now this passage, Second Peter 3, all use that term, last days. There shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Now I would like for you to turn in your Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, you should be able to find a Bible in the pew in front of you, to the book of Hebrews, and you can find that Bible. And if you're not, if you're not familiar with, with the Bible, you can look in the table of contents and find the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. So what have I said so far? The last days will begin with times of refreshing from the Lord. When whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The last days will be increasingly times of prosperity. More people have more money in more nations in this generation than ever before in history. The last days, in the last days, it will be characterized by increasingly dangerous and difficult times. And the last days will be marked by increasing ungodliness, persecution of the people of God, ridicule of the Bible, and especially mocking the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, you can see how he begins this book. God at sundry times, I'm reading from the King James, sundry times means different times, and divers manners in different ways, in different times in different ways, God spoke in time past. He spoke in the past unto the fathers by the prophets. Watch now verse 2. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed as heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. The last days, as I have said many, many times, I want to repeat it again today, the last days began with the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the last days proceed, the focus of the devil and his crowd in the last days will be the person and work of Jesus Christ. They will be trying to destroy the faith of people who believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the Messiah. They don't mind you being religious. 
One of the passages that I read earlier says that they'll have a form of godliness. They'll be religious people. But in their lives, in their language, they will deny the power of God. It hasn't had any impact on them. So I'm asking you this morning, who is this man Jesus? What has he done? And what is he doing today? Now, I'd like for you to turn again to the book, Old Testament book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9. I think I'm going to start sometimes using a little board up here. I use it sometimes on Wednesday, Tuesday night, uh, so I can write down certain things that maybe it would help you. I don't want to assume that everybody understands everything, and I try to go overboard to make sure that it's clear. But the last days began, we just read it from Hebrews chapter 1, the last days began when Jesus was born. Okay? You don't hear a lot of these prophecy people say that, but they began when Jesus was born because the history of the earth is not measured in terms of days and nights and seasons after our calendar, but in terms of the eternal God who is above time. Okay? So the last days have been going on for over 2,000 years, and this is important the last days began with the birth of the Messiah, and the last days will continue until the last day of the last days. Now, we should note that while it is true that God the Father, by God the Spirit, has been speaking to this world by God the Son incarnate for over 2,000 years, he has been speaking to this world through the second person of the Godhead since the beginning of time. That is, God's Son, God the Son, did not begin to exist when Jesus was born. Now, right now, we're talking about God the Son incarnate, I-N-C-A-R-N-A-T-E. Incarnate is a word that means to be covered with flesh. And I'm going to show you some passages in just a few minutes. Just stick with me. But what I want you to understand right now is that the Son of God, the one we call the Son of God, who is God the Son, did not begin to exist when Jesus was born. But he has been here from the beginning. Okay? Now look in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful or Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth henceforth forever, from here and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. All right, now, I've taught a whole series of studies on Isaiah 9, 6. I can go back and find them if some of you would like to, to listen to them. But notice now, in verse 6, it says, a child will be born, and it says a son will be given. Now, please notice, that the child is born, but the son is not born. The child is born, and the son is given. Jesus was born as a child, but as the eternal son of God, he has always been here. 
Jesus is the gift of God. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He's the gift. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to me now. Eternal life is not just living forever. According to the Bible, people that go to hell are going to live forever. But they're going to live forever in hell, and God's people are going to live forever in heaven. Eternal life is, I'm going to show you this in a moment, eternal life is a person. And if you have that person, you have eternal life. And if you don't have that person, you don't have eternal life. A child will be born, but the son will be given. He will be given. He will be given as a gift. The son did not begin to exist when the child was born. The son has existed from the beginning. As long as God has been a father, he has had a son. He couldn't be called a father if he didn't have a son. Jesus is the eternal son given as a child. His human nature had a beginning, but not his divine nature. In the incarnation, that is, in coming into the flesh, the divine nature and the human nature were joined. So the eternal son of God became a man. Why? Well, becoming a man, he could die. God cannot die, but a man can. And God, as a man, can die. And secondly, not only did he come into the flesh in order that he might be able to die, but secondly, that his death might have value that his death might have meaning. That's why we say he can save us because his death has value. His death has meaning. If you die for me or I die for you, I would appreciate it, but you can't redeem me. David said none of us can by any means redeem his brother. The Son of God possesses the very nature of his Father. And that nature is an immortal nature. He never began to exist, nor will he ever cease to exist. Now listen to these passages. I'll tell you where they are, and you can look at them later if you want to. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now unto the king, immortal. You know something, when something is immortal, they can't die. Under the king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1.17. Now listen to this one. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. Paul wrote to young Timothy, who was a young disciple of his, and he said, I charge you in the sight of God, who makes everything alive, and before Jesus Christ, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, in times past, in his times, he says, not in times past, in his times, that is when he comes again, he's going to show that he is the blessed and only potentate, that he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords, that he only has immortality. Dwelling in the light whence no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. That's confusing language. God, in the essence of his being, could not be looked upon, cannot be seen. He is the invisible God. I told you last week how ridiculous that is to the world to say that we are trusting a God we can't see. And we are believing the word of a God that we can't see. But he came into the flesh. More about this in a moment. So that we can relate to him as a man. Now there can be no doubt who this child born and this son given is. If you're still in Isaiah 
chapter uh, 9, you'll notice there it says the government, that is the government of the universe, the government of all the galaxies, the government of everything that is in existence is upon his shoulder. He bears the weight. He is the governor of all things. He is the one without whom nothing can be done. You cannot draw your next breath without his permission. You cannot die until he says you can. He brought you, he allowed you, he permitted you to come into existence, and he is sustaining you right now. And you can't, your heart can't take any more beats than what he has determined. You know what Matthew said when he was talking about Jesus being born? He was talking about the Messiah that had been promised since Genesis 3.15 coming into the flesh. Listen to what Matthew says. He says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's in the book of Matthew, right there in the first couple of chapters. Notice here in Isaiah 9, 6, how his names identify him. He is called Wonderful. He's called Wonderful. Could be translated Supernatural. He is wonderful because of who he is. He's God and man in one person. He is wonderful because of what he does. He redeems. The Bible calls him our lawyer in 1 John. And guess what? He only takes the cases of guilty people. If you're not guilty, I can't recommend him to you as a lawyer. You see, Paul said that God sent his son into the world to save sinners. Paul said, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners. So if you're a good person, I don't have any news for you. If you just ate a steak and I say, I got some great steak we're going to have over at my house after service this morning, say, Bill, I just ate. I'm full. I, I just don't want any steak. You can't give water to a person that's not thirsty. You can't give food to a person that's not hungry. And you can't give salvation to a person that's not a sinner. And you can't set a man free that's never been in bondage. And what we have in America today, we have a, a world full of great and good people, and they're just not sinners. And if you think they are sinners, ask them tomorrow morning when you go to work. And they'll tell you, no. No, no I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm better than so-and-so. This person is called wonderful because of who he is, God and man, and by, because of what he does, he redeems. Then the second, it says counselor. Some combine that wonderful counselor. I'm going to separate them. He's called wonderful. He's called counselor. People today, preachers and psychologists and psychiatrists are getting rich, writing books, trying to tell you how you can live. He is the counselor, my friend. Because he made you. <laughs> he knows how you work. He knows how you think. He knows what your phobias are. What your fears are. He knows what your strengths are. He knows what your weaknesses are. He's the counselor. He can ask all your questions. Whatever your question is, the answer is Jesus Christ. Then he says he's called wonderful. He's called counselor. Look at this. He's called the mighty God. The mighty God, he is God in the flesh. Then he's called the everlasting father. He said to his disciples, he that hath seen me hath seen the father. All you're ever going to see of God the father when you get to heaven is going to be seated there on the throne. And it's going to be the man we call Jesus, who's the Messiah, who's the Christ, who's God in the flesh, God the son. 
Jesus is the father to his children. Those whom he saves, those who trust him, he becomes their, their father. He said this to his disciples. I wish we'd get our Roman Catholic friends to pay attention to the Bible. He said, call no man upon the earth your father. Does that mean you can't call your daddy? Your pro no, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your spiritual father. You don't have a spiritual father on earth. We don't call the priest father. Jesus is our father. We have one father, even God the Son. Then he's called the prince of peace. He's the one that will make peace between heaven and earth, between God and man. He will be the reconciler. He's the only one that's on good terms with God the Father that can bring fallen men to him and reconcile the two of them. And it says next that his government is everlasting. He's ruling right now, and he's going to rule in a special and certain way when time will be no more. And it says he's going to sit upon the throne of David. Now, if you read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, it begins with saying that Jesus is the descendant of David. He was born in the tribe of Judah. He is a physical descendant of David. So that's what it means about David's throne. David is the greatest king Israel ever had. Modern Israel wants to have their, their borders extended to what they were under King David. He's going to be David's descendant. He's going to be the king of kings of which David was a type. David was a king, but Jesus is going to be the king of kings. Then he says his rule will be the only just government in the history of the world. It says that he's going to order it. He's going to establish it with justice. Verse 7. It's going to be a just government established on righteousness. And he will be the sovereign, unexplainable one. It says the zeal of of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Last phrase of verse 7. The zeal of the Lord of hosts. That's about as close as language can get to how in the world God as a man accomplishes what can't be accomplished. He's going to be unexplainable. Listen, to understand God, I'd have to be God. You're not going to ever be able to understand God. You're not going to be able to even understand the Lord Jesus. We don't have to understand him. You understand how electricity works when you plug in your hair blower? <laughs> well, I'm not going to use it. I'm not plugging it in unless I understand how it works. Well, you violate that every day. You flip a switch, the light comes on. You don't know how it works. If I fool around with electricity, I get shocked. You don't know how it all works. I told our men this morning, we just take for granted. You go over to your sink or uh, in your bathroom, you, you, you turn a knob and water comes out. A wonderful thing. Many of the nations of the world don't have that. We, we take it for granted. But when we look at him, he cannot be explained. You remember the old story I told you about the fellow named Silly Billy? He wanted to join a church, and this was one of these highfalutin churches, and you had to appear before the board of elders and deacons, and you had to answer certain questions. And so they said, well, Silly Billy, what in the world? You said that the Lord has saved you? And he said, uh-huh. And they said, uh, well, uh, which one of the persons of the Godhead saved you? He said, you know, the Bible talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Silly Billy said, three in one, one in three, that's too much for Silly Billy. But this can Silly Billy see, one of them died for me. I'll tell you, Silly Billy is way ahead of many of the scholars. 
Many of the scholars are trying to figure God out. Listen to what Paul says about this. I'm reading it. You can find it later. 1 Timothy 3.16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of God. God was manifest in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. God was seen of angels. God was preached unto the Gentiles. God was believed on in the world. And God was received up in the glory. 1 Timothy 3.16. This is a mystery. To understand God, I'd have to be God. He says, without controversy. There is no doubt that such is beyond human understanding. It can only be received by faith. The point that I'm making just now is that although the last days began with the birth of the Messiah as a man, it is also true that from the beginning, God has only and always spoken and acted through the second person of the Godhead, the one we call the Son of God, or God the Son. Now, I want you to get this truth now. I'm contending that God, the Father or the Spirit, has never spoken or has never revealed anything to anyone at any time except through God the Son. Now turn back to the first of your Bible, to the very first book of Genesis. Okay? The very first book of Genesis. <clears throat> Chapter 3, God made the first couple. He was their father, and they were his son and daughter. And the, the man was called Adam, which means from the earth. And the woman was called Eve, which means mother of living, mother of the living. So they were one big happy family. Until someone entered and convinced Eve that her father was lying to her. The serpent came to her and asked her this question, end of verse 1, Are you able to eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, don't eat it, don't touch it, lest you die. And verse 4, and the serpent said, you will not surely die. You won't die. Do you know of anybody since you've been in this world, you know of anybody that has kept on living? We're dying. And you're going to die and I'm going to die. Some of you might live to attend my funeral. And you're going to say, I remember when Bill told us that he was going to die. And if I die, that means you're going to die. Unless the Lord comes back and interrupts it. The, the devil said, you won't die. You won't die. God knows, verse 5, in the day you eat... Let me translate that for you. In the day you become independent of God, in the day you don't listen to him and let him tell you what you can do and what you can't do, what you should do, what you should not do, what is good for you and what's bad for you, the day you decide, I'm going to decide for myself. The day you do that, your eyes are going to be open. Your eyes are going to be open. And you're going to be like God, verse 5. Knowing good and evil would be better translated, determining for yourself what is good and what is evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took the fruit and she gave to her husband. And he loved her so much he took sides with her against God. Tell your wives you have a lot of influence over your husband. I said, laughing about what Todd said earlier about coming over to his house. I heard a man say the other day, I am the head of my house. 
and I have my wife's permission to say so. I said, is that right? Yeah. I had her down on her knees the other day. You did? Yeah. What did she say? She said, come out from under that bed, you coward. <laughs> well, there was no fussing and fighting here between Adam and Eve until they disobeyed the Lord. And she gave it to her husband, and he did eat, verse 7, and their eyes were opened, and all of a sudden they became self-conscious. They had been God-conscious. They had been filled with God. They weren't concerned about who's first and who's last and who gets in line first, and they weren't concerned about any of that. But now all of a sudden, they become self-conscious. They know they're naked. They tried showing together fig leaves, once there's a picture of works, all that we try to do to cover up our nakedness. Now watch this very strange language. I don't know what translation you have, but this is what this says in verse 8. Genesis 3, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking. They heard a voice walking. They didn't see anybody walking. They heard a voice walking. In the garden, in the cool of the day. And now because they have violated their trust with their father, now they are, before they loved him and they knew he loved them, but now they're afraid of him. And they ran and they tried to hide themselves. And you know what? We've been running ever since. And men try to hide. They try to hide in work. They try to hide in travel. They try to hide in all kinds of things. But you can't get away from God. Even if you escape him your entire life, you got to meet him when you leave here. Notice now, verse 8. They heard the voice walking. Now listen to me. When God created the world, or the universe, he created it by speaking it into existence. The word that he spoke is the second person of the Godhead. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. I said God has never said anything to anybody. He's never revealed anything to anybody except through the second person of the Godhead who's called the word. And here the word, the voice of God is walking in the garden. Again, you'll notice that Neither Adam nor Eve ever saw a form. They heard the voice of the Lord, but they saw nothing. And this reminds me of Deuteronomy 4, 12, and verses 15 and 16, when God said to the people of Israel through Moses, the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but you saw no form. You only heard a voice. That's Deuteronomy 4 verse 12. Deuteronomy 4 verse 15. Take heed to yourselves. You saw no manner of similitude. You saw no form in the day that the Lord spoken to you in Horeb out of the midst of fire. He goes on to say several times, take care that you didn't see anything. You just heard. You see, that it's impossible to draw a picture of God because no one has ever seen him. Well, I know one little boy that has seen him. Sunday, his, his, his teacher, Sunday school teacher, gave him some crayons and gave him some pieces of paper and said, draw something or draw someone. Little boy there named Jimmy. I'm surprised that this picture that Jimmy drew is not in the archives in the Vatican in Rome. The teacher, going by looking at all that they were drawing, and she came by Jimmy to inspect his drawing, and she said, Jimmy, who are you drawing? And he said, oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, Jimmy, no one knows what God looks like. Jimmy said, they will when I get through. <laughs> How did God create the world? With a voice. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Lord said. 
let there be. And there was. The worlds were created. They did not evolve from nothing. What is the confession of evolutionary atheism? It is that nothing created everything. G.K. Chesterton said this, I quote it, It is absurd to complain that it is unthinkable for an unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing and then pretend that it is more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything. We got a world built on evolutionary atheism, and that's what they believe. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 that the worlds, the universe, were not made from previously existing materials. Hebrews 11 verse 3. What is seen was not made of things which are visible. What can be seen was made out of things which cannot be seen. The worlds were created. And the worlds were not created out of previously existing materials. And the worlds were created through the spoken word of God. And the word of God is the one we call Jesus. God the Father and God the Spirit have never created anything, spoken anything, revealed anything to anyone at any time except through God the Son. Now, turn back to the New Testament. To the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shone in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Now to save a little time. Go down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh. The Word that was with God, that was God, by whom all things were created, came, became flesh, became a man, and dwelt among us. He lived here, and we beheld His glory. He had the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now notice, the Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God from the beginning. The Word was with God from the beginning because the Word was God. And you will notice that the Word of God is identified as a person. It says all things were made by Him. It doesn't say all things were made by it. Not by an impersonal force or a demiurge but by a personality, one who can see, who can think, who can hear. David asked this question. He said, do you think that since God made man with eyes that he's able to see? Do you think that if God gave man the ability to hear that he's able to hear? Do you think that if God gave man a brain that works like a computer, that he's able to think and to reason and to deduct? By man's speech, man's word, we can know his thoughts. Whenever you speak, at that moment, I know what you're thinking. Because you express your mind by your word. But we can only know what you're thinking insofar as you speak. The words are the expressions of the mind. Now Christ, as the word of God, makes known the eternal person and will of God. Look at verse 18, John chapter 1, verse 18. No man hath seen God at any time. That is, God in the essence of his being, God as spirit, 
the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The only thing you're ever going to see of God visibly is what you see in Jesus. And in heaven, seated, the Bible often says, at the right hand, that's a, called an anthropomorphism. In other words, uh, uh, morphous from the Latin has to do with the body. Anthro has to do with man. So when we read statements in the Bible that give body parts to God, like the right arm of the Lord, or the eyes of God run to and fro in the earth, or God hears, those are anthropomorphic statements to help us understand what God is saying to us through the prophet. We have also anthropopathic statements. Those are statements that attribute emotional things to God. God was angry. God was grieved. God was happy. Okay? So here we read, No man has seen God in the essence of his being at any time. The only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed. And that word revealed or declared, some of you may have a different word. Uh, that is a word that we use, meaning to open up. When we translate a passage, we exegete it. It's exegomai. It's exomai. It means to explain or to interpret. So, Jesus is the interpretation of God. Jesus is the explanation of God. Jesus is the revelation of God. Now, listen to these verses. We can't turn to all of them. This is from 1 John. Same guy who wrote the Gospel of John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, little epistles. In 1st John chapter 1, verse 1, this is what John wrote. That which was from the beginning... Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, we have looked upon, our hands have handled the word of life. For that life was manifested, and we've seen it, we bear witness, we show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made known to us. That's what we have seen, and which we have heard, we are now declaring unto you that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So he says that that eternal life came into the flesh, and he says, we've seen Him, we've heard Him, we touched Him, we talked with Him, and that was the eternal life from all eternity. Listen to this passage, John chapter 17, verse 3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John chapter 17, in verse 3. We read in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, that Jesus is the Word of God. I saw heaven open, behold, it was a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war, and his flames were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The Word of God. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he will smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of God, as that speaks of his death. And on his vesture and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16. He's called the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. The Word of God who knows all things in us and outside of us, who can discern our thoughts, who can know the intents of our heart. We just read in John 1, 18, he's the revelation and the explanation of God. He is the ex egomai, the one who declares, the one who exegetes God. Now the beginning of the end 
of the last days may have begun. I don't know. I'm not a prophet, son of a prophet. I don't set times and days. I told you the last days began with the birth of Christ, and the last days will continue until the last day of earth. So we're in the last days. We've been on them over 2,000 years. And what I want to show you, and what I want to close with, is I want you to know that the person you're dealing with is the eternal God who came into the flesh, took a man, took, a, took the body of a man, the appearance of a man, in order to die, to pay for our sins, to redeem us and to reconcile us to God. That's the great and wonderful Savior that we have. I realize that some of the prophetic events were fulfilled by the Roman invasion of Jerusalem in 70 AD, but I believe for example, in Luke chapter 21, verses 28 through 36, Jesus, talking about the last days, says this, and listen. When these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads. Your redemption draws nigh. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts are overcharged with carousing, with drunkenness, with the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unexpectedly. Now listen to this statement. For as a snare it shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The whole earth, not just in Jerusalem in 70 A.D., so there were some things fulfilled then, but not all things. It's going to come on all the earth. And we need to be ready. When you see these things, what things? All the things I've been talking to you about for the last few weeks. Not only signs in the heavens and signs in the earth and signs which manifest themselves through the human race. We're all confused today about who we are and where we are and what we are. We have lots of passages here I could, I could give to you, but I my time is gone. What is happening today through the preaching and teaching of the gospel is that people are being forgiven of their sins, and they're coming to know the Lord, and they're being transfigured from what they were to sons and daughters of God. There was a fella born in 1851, and he was a, a black young man. It was just after the Civil War, and he was 20 years old. And he left the South, and he went north, and he ended up in Philadelphia, 20 years old, young black man, 20 years old. He had never seen the inside of a schoolroom, only a cotton field. So he got a job. He got a job as a mortar carrier. He couldn't read or write. He couldn't even write his own name. But you know what happened? The Lord saved him. And when the Lord saved him, he wanted to read the Bible. So he started going to school at night. This is a true story. Started going to school at night. He worked for a stonemason during the day. And he went to school at night. And he learned to read. And he became the janitor of a black church. And he served as the janitor of a black church until he was 50 years old. And when he was 50 years old, he was called to be the pastor of that church. And he pastored that church until he was 82 years old. And he preached to the largest crowds of any preacher in the United States. And he wrote great hymns. He wrote, nothing between my soul and the Savior. All of you have heard that. He wrote, take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. His name was Charles A. Tindley. 
T-I-N-D-L-E-Y, born in 1851, died in 1933. God chose, called, and saved the simple, uneducated, illiterate, black boy and made him a preacher and a great hymn writer. That's what he's doing today. What can he do with you? What can he do with you? It was D.L. Moody. I don't agree with all D.L. Moody's theology. But D.L. Moody said, The world has yet to see what God will do through a man or a woman that's completely yielded to him. The world has yet to see what God will do. May the Lord add his blessings on the teaching of his word.